Greetings, my name is Chuck Anderson, and I'm the editor of Discovery News. I don't know if uh, newspaper headlines ever grab your attention. Um, my wife, she, ta she pays attention to sports headlines. As some of you may be addicted to what's coming up in the weather, Wall Street. Of course, COVID-19 is always in the headlines. We're kind of tired of that, aren't we? And the same is true of politics. But I'll tell you, there was a, a headline that I saw just recently. I was coming out of Walgreens drugstore. And uh, USA Today was there, and the headlines really stopped me. Uh, Putin won't stop with Ukraine, experts warn. Well, that's really quite interesting. Russia is once again in the news all over the world. And of course, uh, they're talking about looking, looks like they might do an invasion of Ukraine. Uh, just to give you an idea of what may be going on in today's world, uh, here's a map that shows in the, in the lighter, in the pink color, the former members of the USSR. And of course, uh, Belarus is really not a former member. They're in very close alliance with, with Russia. But we see Ukraine, and by the way, um, just last week they were reporting some 100,000 troops were massed on the border of Ukraine. And then they revised that just a couple days ago and said it's more like 130,000. But countries like Estonia, Latvia, the Baltics, Lithuania, uh, Georgia, other places are really quite concerned not knowing exactly what's going to take place, but it doesn't look good. It could be that, uh, that Russia is trying to reestablish the USSR. Uh, the concern is not just, of course, about Russia and the USSR, but we've mentioned Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. I was in Estonia a number of years ago, and uh, going across on a, on a, a ferry going across the Black Sea, I remember I finally found a, a deck chair and I sat down in it and the lady looked over at me and she said, well, a Russian is sitting there and she'll be back and she'll kick you up. And I recognized real quick that there was real animosity between the, Ethi uh, the uh, Estonians and, and the Russians. I don't know if you knew this, but when Estonia fell to communist Russia, some years ago, half the population was taken out to Siberia, and then that population was exchanged with a number of Russians that were brought in. And if you go to Tallinn, Estonia today, you will find real animosity between the uh, his Estonians and, of course, the Russians. Uh, but the people of Estonia, I will tell you, are living in constant fear that Russia will once again usurp her power and and uh, they're not the only ones. There's Georgia, and of course, beyond that is Romania and, and Poland and so forth. But these nations are concerned about what Russia may be up to. You might ask the question, um, why should Christians even show any interest in what Russia is doing in, uh, in Eastern Europe? Well, the fact is, Russia is one of the end-time nations that's are found in the pages of, of the Bible, of the Holy Scripture, the pages of prophecy. And I don't see Ukraine, I don't see Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Georgia, Romania, Poland. I don't see any of those countries. But Israel is, of course, in the prophetic scriptures, and so is Russia. And uh, we'll get to Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, perhaps in another study. But um, there's... There's going to be a time of, of tremendous aggression when Russia and a number of Islamic countries will come against Israel. And so we watch that with great interest, wondering, are we going to live during a time when we see those things happen? Well, the prophet Daniel may have been the first one to get just even a glimpse of this end time Russia. And it's found in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, I'm going to put the scripture up on the screen so that you can see it if you don't have a Bible with you. 
But uh, Daniel himself had a dream. Remember that Daniel was the interpreter of dreams. God gave him a gift when he was in ancient Babylon. And he was one that could tell and he could interpret dreams. Now, Daniel had a nightmare. And he couldn't even interpret his own dream. It was very confusing to him. And in, in Daniel chapter 7, his dream was about a, about a lion that had eagle's wings, wings that, were, that were clipped off. And he also, in his dream, was another beast that was a bear that had three ribs in its mouth. And the words uh, that were spoken was, Arise and devour much flesh. Kind of like a bear coming out of hibernation. And then really a strange creature, um, he dreamed about a leopard that had four heads and the wings of a fowl, like a chicken. And then the last beast was, uh, was just... Uh, was ugly and terrifying to Daniel. It came up out of the sea and it had 10 horns. We'll talk about those things in a minute. But let's read from Daniel chapter, chapter 7. You follow along and uh, I'll read from the scriptures. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. And then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens were stirring up the great sea, we believe the sea of humanity. Verse 3, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given unto it. In verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second, like a bear. And it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between its teeth. And they said, Thus to it arise, devour much flesh. After this, I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon its back four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had a great iron teeth that devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before which there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn, uh, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Many of our uh, Bible scholars, and uh, even the Schofield Bible that I, that I have, and many of the writings about Old Testament scriptures will say that, that this dream of Daniel was just a repeat of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had about four beasts. Those beasts represented Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Well, I want to go through that in case you're not familiar with that real quickly, but the first dream that Daniel interpreted was a nightmare seen by the king of Babylon. It's found in Daniel chapter 2. And the dream was an image that represented an outline of, of four future Gentile kingdoms. It may have looked something like this, although none of us know for sure. But it was made of, of different materials. A head of gold, which represented Babylon. Arms and chest of, of silver that represented Medo-Persia, the divided empire of the Medes and the Persians. And then a belly of brass representing Greece, the world empire under Alexander the Great. And then legs of iron representing Rome. And finally, ten toes of iron and clay that represented an end time kingdom that would control the entire world. By the way, it's interesting. You notice those ten toes and then later in Daniel chapter 7, uh, the ten horns that's upon that beast. Well, as Daniel interpreted that dream, he saw 
that there was a huge rock that came down. I, I kind of visualize it like a bowling ball. And it came down. It was a, a rock that was not cut by man, uh, just a big boulder that came down, and it crashed into, into that image and smashed it to smithereens. And the rock re uh, represented a future kingdom that would bring uh, all human governments to a final end. Now that's something to shout about. <laughs> uh, the end of, of the wicked human governments that we see all over the world today. No more politicians. No more politics. Uh, if you can't get excited about that, you can't get excited about anything. But that rock represented the Lord Jesus Christ who will one day return to earth in power and great glory and he will bring all human governments to an end and he will establish an eternal kingdom of righteousness. Well, we go back to uh, the comment about so many of the Bible scholars uh, that Daniel chapter 7 is just a repeat of, of what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Is that true? I believe there is something very wrong with that interpretation. Daniel's nightmare could not be a, a repeat of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream for several reasons, and I want to list them for you. Number one, the beast in Daniel's vision will exist during the end time days just prior to the return of the Son of Man to establish his righteous 1,000 year, what we call the millennial kingdom. And we read in, in uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, I watched till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. I was watching in the night visions, verse 13, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. In verse 14, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all of the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and uh, which shall never pass away. And so these kingdoms that, uh, that uh, are represented by those four beasts were just prior to what we see later in that chapter, and that is the coming of the Son of Man in power and great glory. Uh, number two, the beast represented end-time kingdoms that will lose their dominion, but they will continue until Christ returns to power and great glory. Uh, we read in verse 12, As for the rest of the beasts, they had your dominion taken away, and yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Uh, I have to remind you that Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and ancient Rome, they've been gone for thousands of years. But these end time nations, although they lose their power, are going to continue to exist until the coming of Christ. And then number three, uh, Daniel was grieved, deeply troubled. That's strange because Daniel was the interpreter of dreams. And if this were just a, a mere repeat, he would have known that. He could have understand that. We read in verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Uh, Daniel would uh, not have been troubled about this vision if it had just simply been a repeat of what Nebuchadnezzar saw. Number four, Daniel was so confused by the dream that he actually asked an angel to interpret it for him. And we read two verses, verses 15 and 16. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came to, uh, near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. And then lastly, number five, the four beasts prophesied four mighty future kingdoms, and, and the vision, by the way, was given near the end of the Babylonian Empire. Um, according, to, according to the scripture, and the interpretation from the, from the angel, these are all future kingdoms that are yet to come. And Daniel had this vision at the time when Babylon was, was almost finished, when the Medes and the Persians would take over. 
We read in verse 17, these four great beasts, which are four, are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. This is all future stuff. And Daniel was living at a time uh, very near the very end of, of the Babylonian Empire. Well, our primary interest today is this bear coming out of hibernation, verse 5. But we'd like to take a, a look real briefly at the entire passage, so follow along with me. And we'll start with verse 4. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings, and I beheld till its wings were plucked or cut off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon its feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. That's a fascinating verse. Um, whoever this world kingdom was uh, would lose its power, and instead of having the heart of a beast, would go back to having the heart of a man and no longer be a, 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 a strong conquering nation, and no longer the heart of a, of a conquering beast. Uh, the lion with eagle's wings that were plucked off. Uh, was this Babylon? Uh, some... Uh, have to uh, ask the question, I wonder if this could be the British Empire. By the way, it's a, it's a fascinating thing, but the British Empire, if you go to London, you will find images and statues of the lion with, with wings, with his paw upon the, upon the globe, upon the world. There was a time, they say, that the, that the sun never went down on the British Empire. And uh, we think that this could very well be one of those last name last uh, time nations that's going to exist and lose its power, but it'll be around till the time of Christ. Uh, the eagle's wings that were plucked off, uh, what could that be referring to? Is it possible that the uh, line with eagle's wings plucked off could be Great Britain using one of, losing one of its colonies like the United States, eagle wings plucked off? I will tell you, that the British Empire began to crumble when the eagle's wings of, of America were plucked off in 1776. Uh, the similarity uh, is, is just really quite astounding as we think about that. Uh, Daniel 7:12. as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Well, the British Empire is no more, but England is still existing. So it's a really pretty fad, fascinating thing. Uh, it was just a couple years ago that the Prime Minister of, of uh, Great Britain, meeting in Parliament with the leaders of their government, admitted that the worldwide British Empire no longer exists. Um, a lion with its eagle's wings clipped off. Of course, then we find this bear with three ribs in its mouth. And we read about that in, in verse 5 of, of Daniel chapter 7. And behold, another beast, a second like a bear, and it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between its teeth. And they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Uh, the picture seems to be of a hungry bear coming out of hibernation, a bear that is is now becoming increasingly not only hungry, but aggressive. And uh, we can't help but wonder if that bear is symbolic and representing uh, Russia in the end times. Here's a fascinating thing. I don't know if you knew this about the USSR, but they had, they had three votes in the United Nations, and they consisted of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, as you see on this map. And of course, Belarus is still in, 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 in close cahoots with, with Russia, but Ukraine. Ukraine seems to be a, an object that Putin and, and Russia are very interested in getting back. Well, since 1990, Russia has really been in hibernation. But it's like an awakening bear. She's hungry and becoming increasingly aggressive. And you read those, those, those words in verse 5, arise and devour much flesh. We do know from Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 that Russia will one day invade the land of Israel. And we'll talk about that in the future. Uh, this third beast is really quite remarkable. 
And uh, it may sound a little confusing to you. It's a leopard with four heads and four wings of a fowl. Uh, what does that represent? That's quite amazing, but um, Germany has a tank that it is actually called the leopard. It's very fast. It can move very, very quickly. Four heads of, uh, of the leopard, uh, we believe, are representing four kingdoms. Uh, I don't know if you knew what Hitler called his Nazi kingdom. Most of you know. It was called the Third Reich. The Third Reich means simply the Third Kingdom. So is this talking about a future kingdom where there's going to be increased uh, strength from, from Europe, from Germany? Very possibly a Fourth Reich. But the wings of the fowl are, are very perplexing until you begin to understand that the country of France recognizes as their national symbol uh, a fighting cock rooster. And, uh, and so we, we can't help but wonder, is this depicting for us a reunified uh, Europe having greater power? And uh, pretty interesting. Leopard with wings of a fowl uh, may indeed represent Western Europe. Well, this four-headed leopard with wings of a fowl uh, possibly prophesy the European a common market and so forth, apparently led by Germany and France. Um, now, the fourth beast is, is very fascinating, and we won't take a lot of time with it today. But this fourth beast was a powerful and very destructive kingdom which prophesied a worldwide confederation of ten regional kingdoms which appear to be in the formation stages today. And we read this in, this in this passage in Daniel chapter 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, and it had great iron teeth that devoured in broken pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before which there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Uh, we believe that that passage is talking about, the, about the, uh, the time of the Antichrist that will be found as you read in the book of Revelation. And it would appear that when he comes to power that three of these kingdoms are going to be plucked up, just like you pull a weed, like you pull a dandelion, plucked up by the roots. I think the scripture uh, is, is telling us that there's coming a time when three of the ten nations are going to be totally destroyed. Well, in verse 23, we read about the, uh, the size of this incredible kingdom. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. We believe that we're even watching the early stages, the formation of, of a worldwide kingdom. There's great efforts being made for nations to surrender their, their, uh, their national autonomy and their own constitutions and come under a global system, a one world government. Well, this fourth beast is dreadful and terrible, ruthless, without mercy, a monster with ten horns. Uh, ten horns representing ten kingdoms. And um, it's interesting that in the United Nations, there's, there's a study group called the Club of Rome. And they've already identified ten regions that would represent a future uh, one world, a global type system. Uh, those things are on the drawing board, if you will, in the minds of many people. Well, Daniel prophesied that a powerful leader would arise up and totally destroy three of the kings and their kingdoms. And as he said in verse 8, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before which there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Uh, I think that Russia is one of those, as we'll read in, uh, next time we do a study in, in uh, Exodus chapter 39, verse 6. Uh, Russia, God is going to send fire upon Russia, 
and it would appear upon other nations. Uh, I believe that Russia and the Arab League of Nations may be two of them. There's a third country that's beyond the sea, uh, away from Russia and so forth. Uh, who are they? Not sure. But the Bible has a lot to say about Russia. There's uh, what's known as the War of Gog and Magog, and uh, coming a time when Russia will one day invade the land of Israel. That's all found in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, and we'll do, a, we'll do a, a study on that in the near future. But the prophecies of future events should not cause fear in the hearts of those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. Uh, I share these things, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't send a, a, a wave of panic through your heart in any way. Uh, you, if you uh, are meeting in a group and you have a discussion time, uh, you might even want to discuss, why did God give us the prophetic scriptures in the first place? Why does he tell us about future events? That would be a good discussion. Uh, the Lord has written these things down for us, and they're for a reason. And it would be good to discuss some of those things. I want to encourage you that in the world that we're living in, uh, what's happening in Ukraine and so forth, I don't think that that's depicted in Scripture with the exception of, of this bear that, that is arising on its side, coming up out of hibernation and uh, with the three ribs in its mouth, and the ribs speak out to it, arise and devour much flesh. We may be seeing that happen. But I want to encourage you uh, to keep your eyes on Israel. Uh, that's, where, that's where God's timeline, and that's where things are, are happening that should really grab our attention. And as you keep your eyes on Israel, also keep your eyes on, on the skies for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, his return. Uh, when I think of Matthew 24, 42, I think of those incredible words, Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord will come. And therefore, be you ready. For in such an hour, as you think not, the Son of Man will come. Truly, our, our hope is in the Lord. If you've never trusted him as your savior, I would encourage you to, in a very humble prayer, uh, acknowledge to the Lord that you know that he died on the cross for you. By the way, maybe I should just share a couple of things in case you don't know these things, but uh, Jesus Christ, when he was born in Bethlehem, that was not his beginning. Uh, the scripture tells us that the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us. The creator of the world, became human, born of a virgin girl, had to be born of a virgin, otherwise he would have had a sin nature just like you and me. But Jesus would grow up and, and minister amongst the people, three years with his disciples, uh, doing miracles, healing people, feeding multitudes, raising the dead. But the reason Jesus came to this world was for one reason, and that is to give his life as a sacrifice for our sins. This is God saying, I'll take the penalty for all the sins that have ever been committed and all the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus when he hung upon that cross. What an incredible thing. Uh, God, the creator, didn't have to do that. But the scripture tells us that God showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then the Bible goes on to say that whosoever will will believe this with all their heart and call upon the name of the Lord can be saved. And uh, if you have not ever placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, can I encourage you to do that today? It can be a very simple prayer. Something like, something like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you for paying the penalty for all my sins. And Lord, I'd like to ask you to, to come in and to take my sin away and, and, uh, and make me one of your children. Forgive me for the life that I've lived. And Lord, I trust you today to save me from my sins. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say to you that it's not a magical prayer. It could be a prayer from your heart. That's where... The Lord looks at our heart, not just our words. 
But if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, do it soon. Uh, he may come one day, very, very soon. As we talk about the prophetic scriptures, uh, may they not send a chill or a panic through your heart at all. Uh, the Lord knows what's going to take place upon planet Earth. He knows all about Russia. He knows all about Israel. He also has set a time when he is going to come, and he is our hope. But we'll pick up with this and uh, look into Ezekiel 38. 39, next time we get together. Thanks for joining us today. God bless.